Uh, welcome, everyone. I'm Jennifer Kirby, and it's my pleasure to moderate our panel today, The Challenges of Multi-Party and Multi-Contract Issues in International Arbitration and the Anticipated ICC Rule Changes. We have a fabulous panel today, and I'm delighted to, to introduce them, though many of you, of course, already know them. First, we have Laura Abramson. Laura spent almost 20 years as in-house counsel with Occidental Petroleum, where she led numerous arbitrations, including an ICSID arbitration against Ecuador. Some of you may be familiar with that decision because it was recognized by Global Arbitration Review as the most important published decision of 2012. Laura also served as in-house counsel to ACOM, a multinational engineering firm, before recently leaving to become a full-time arbitrator and mediator with JAMS. She served as counsel or arbitrator under the rules of many major arbitral institutions, including the ICC, LCIA, and ICDR, as well as in ad hoc arbitrations under the UNCITRAL rules. She's also a member of the Court of Arbitration for Sport in Lausanne, Switzerland. Next, we have Jiva Filipich. Jiva is the managing counsel at the ICC court. In that role, she oversees the court's case management teams and is deeply involved in the administration of the ICC's caseload. Before her promotion to managing counsel, Jiva was counsel for the Eastern Mediterranean and Middle East. Jiva's a Slovenian lawyer. Before joining the ICC, she clerked for the Ljubljana District Court and for Martin Hunter at Essex Court Chambers in London. She also worked in private practice in Vienna and served as an in-house counsel for the Bank of Slovenia. She holds an LLM in international business and commercial law from King's College London and speaks numerous languages, including Croatian, English, French, German, Italian, Serbian, and Spanish. Next, we have Paul Di Pietro. Paul is the ICC counsel for North America, a position he took in July this year. In this position, Paul is based in New York City and heads the case management team that oversees cases with links to North America. Before his promotion to counsel, Paul was a deputy counsel for Latin America. Paul is a Venezuelan lawyer. Before joining the ICC, he clerked with prominent multinational firms in international arbitration and worked in private practice in Venezuela. Paul studied law in France, Spain, and Venezuela and has a master's degree in economic law from Sciences Po. He speaks English, French, Italian, and Spanish. Last but not least, we have Claudia Solomon. Claudia is a partner at Latham & Watkins and global co-chair of the firm's international arbitration practice. She's recognized as a leading international arbitration lawyer by Chambers Global, Legal 500, and Who's Who Legal. She's acted as lead counsel in arbitrations conducted under all of the major arbitral rules in venues around the globe, under both common law and civil law, and with a focus on the energy construction and technology sectors. She also has particular expertise with respect to post M&A and joint venture disputes. She also regularly serves as tribunal president, sole arbitrator, co-arbitrator, and emergency arbitrator. Claudia is currently a vice president of the ICC court, and she's been recommended for election as president of the court with effect from 1 July 2021, putting her on a path to become the first woman president of the court in its almost 100 year history. Claudia was actively involved in the development of the ICC guidance note on possible measures aimed at mitigating the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic and the 2021 rules that will take effect on the 1st of January next year and are the focus of our panel. We'd like our panel to be as interactive as possible. So to that end, we've arranged to allow for members of the audience to speak by voice and video. If you'd like to speak, please use the Q&A function to let us know, to sort of virtually raise your hand and we can then call on you and activate your mic and camera so that you can address your questions and comments to the panel. Again, please use the Q&A function for this purpose, not the chat, but the Q&A. And please be so kind as to remember to turn off your mic and camera once you're done speaking. 
We look forward to your participation and hope to have a lively discussion. So please feel free to raise your hand via the Q&A anytime. So uh, with that, Claudia, perhaps you could start us off by explaining the ICC rule revision process and placing the 2021 provisions on consolidation and joinder in some historical context. Perfect. Thank you so much, Jennifer. And before I begin, I also just want to give a shout out to Stephanie Cohen and Jeffrey Rosenthal uh, Nyack and obviously the ICC for their phenomenal organization of New York Arbitration Week. The programming this week is really terrific. Uh, so the 2021 rules uh, build on the framework of the 2012 and 2017 revisions and mark another step toward even more efficient, flexible, and transparent arbitration proceedings. Uh, the ICC rules are amended periodically to meet the needs of users and the evolving landscape, including the changing use of technology. And the 2021 rules make I ICC arbitration, I submit, even more attractive for both large complex arbitrations and smaller cases. So the new rules will enter into force on January 1st, 2021. And the 2017 rules will continue to apply for all cases registered with the court before January 1st, 2021. So before then, the ICC court will re also release an updated version of the note to parties and arbitral tribunals on the conduct of arbitration last amended in January 2019. So let me turn specifically to complex cases. Uh, as you may know, the ICC has a global reputation for its experience in dealing with complex, high value, multi-party and multi-contract arbitrations. And this is particularly prevalent in disputes arising out of the construction and energy sectors, which account for approximately 40% of ICC's caseload. You know, in the, ICE, in the construction sector, we see multi-party and multi-contract disputes, such as those arising between owner, contractor, and subcontractor. We also see them in the financial sector between lender, borrower, and guarantor. And of course, in a myriad of other sectors. So the new provisions in the 2021 rules allow the joinder of additional parties in the course of the arbitration and an amendment allows the consolidation of cases involving uh, different parties and these changes will make the ICC rules even more uh, suitable for these types of cases. Um, Claudia, can you maybe <clears throat> just give us a, a little bit of sort of historical perspective on the rules in the sense that um, how have they evolved over time? I mean, these provisions, I, I'm sort of the resident dinosaur on this panel because, you know, when I was at the ICC, we were under the 1998 rules and the rules have changed, you know, so dramatically since then. H how do these current changes really fit within uh, th this kind of e evolving, um, th this kind of evolving change towards a desire to embrace more and make more flexible and, um, and easier to use all of these provisions regarding joinder consolidation, et cetera. Sure. So article seven on joinder was uh, added in 2020, in 2012, so after uh, the 1998 rules. Uh, before then, uh, there wasn't a procedure in the rules for joinder of parties, although the court had developed various practices. And Jennifer, when you were at the Secretariat, you probably did have to deal with those specific uh, workarounds. Uh, the key component for Article 7 is that a request for joinder must be initiated by a party already in the arbitration. In other words, there's no mechanism for third parties to request to join, you know, such as amicus curie in court litigation, unless all parties have established a procedure to do so. And certainly that does happen, particularly in investment arbitration under the ICC rules. 
So the new paragraph in the 2020 run rules is Article 7.5, and that allows the tribunal to join at the request of any party, a consenting additional party to the arbitration, and this is the key, after the tribunal has been constituted. So in the previous rules, no joinder was allowed, as I mentioned, after the confirmation or appointment of any arbitrator, unless all parties agreed, including the additional party. Now, joinder can occur with the consent of only one party in the arbitration and the party to be joined if the tribunal determines it's in the interest of efficiency. So any such joinder is subject to the additional party accepting the constitution of the tribunal that's already taken place before it joined and agreeing to the terms of reference if those have already been concluded. So in deciding on that request for joinder, it is uh, for the tribunal to make that determination. And under this new provision 7.5, the tribunal has to take into account, and this is the language, all relevant circumstances. And that uh, ranges from jurisdictional issues to procedural factors, such as whether it has prima facie jurisdiction over the additional party, the timing of the request for joinder, possible conflicts of interest, and the impact of the joinder on the procedure. So this uh, flexibility and determination by the tribunal promotes procedural efficiency and flexibility, particularly when the need for joinder arises or becomes apparent as the case unfolds. This could include, for example, situations when the additional party was not named a claimant or respondent at the outset, but it turns out they have a vested interest in the outcome of the dispute. So then turning to consolidation, just to lay the framework in ICC arbitration, the term consolidation is used to refer to the procedural mechanism whereby two or more pending arbitrations, that is arbitrations with separate ICC case numbers are merged into a single arbitration. Consolidation pursuant to article 10 does not include situations where claims have been brought in a single arbitration under more than one contract or more than one arbitration agreement. That is covered by Article 9. So Article 10 sets out the circumstances in which upon a party's request, the court may decide to consolidate two or more arbitrations pending under the rules into one arbitration. And consolidation enables a single tribunal to decide all the issues, which is typically more efficient and less expensive. It also eliminates the risk of inconsistent decisions rendered in different proceedings. Of course, consolidation is not always appropriate and Article 10 sets out the framework within which the court determines whether or not to consolidate. So again, just to put it in historic context, in 2012, Article 10 was added, considerably expanding the court's power to consolidate. Under the former, what was Article 4-6 um, under the 1998 rules, unless the parties had agreed to consolidate, the court could order consolidation only when the parties in the proceedings uh, to be consolidated were the same. But consolidation can be appropriate in other circumstances, such as, for example, where parties, although not all involved in the, all the pending arbitrations, are not, nonetheless bound by a single arbitration agreement. For example, parties A, B, and C sign a contract containing an arbitration agreement. A initiates the first arbitration against B and C, and then B, initiates a second arbitration against C. In situations such as this, it may be useful to bring everybody together into a single arbitration. And Paul and Jiva are gonna go through uh, detailed scenarios on this. Uh, so 
Importantly, the court cannot consolidate cases on its own volition. Rather, Article 10 requires a request for consolidation. So that can be made by any party to any of the other, any of the arbitrations. So the 2021 rules, um, the changes are made to clarify that the provisions on consolidation uh, expand the arbitrator's ability to consolidate multiple proceedings and join numerous parties to a single arbitration. So it's 10 uh, B, where it specifies that consolidation is possible under several agreements with the same arbitration clause, adding the plural agreements, whereas the 2017 rules contain only the singular form. So this means consolidation can occur with the arbitrations involving different parties and claims are made under more than one contract, provided the arbitration agreements are the same. So in other words, the same arbitration agreements in both arbitrations. And Article 10C sets out more plainly that it concerns claims between the same parties, even if not made under the same arbitration agreement or agreements. And just want to note lastly, uh, Article 12.9, the 2021 rules provides that in exceptional circumstances, the court can appoint each member of the tribunal if the application of the party's agreement would lead to a significant risk of unequal treatment and unfairness. Uh, this provision allows the court to disregard the arbitration agreements that may pose a risk to the validity of the award by requiring a procedure for constituting the tribunal that doesn't treat the parties equally in the circumstances of the particular case. And this reflects the principle upheld in the Dutco decision of the French court of Castillon. Thank you. I mean, I recall, I, again, being the dinosaur, I, I was involved in, in the changes that were made uh, when the 2012 rules were created. And I remember that back then, at least one of sort of the founding principles of the, of the rule revision at that time was that we were really changing the rules to take account of real situations that had developed in real cases across across the ICC's caseload that that really the the 1998 rules just hadn't fully anticipated and that we felt really needed to be addressed. I, I, I understand that the same is true here, that there were uh, numerous cases that came before the court where effectively the, the current, the, the 2012 rules just weren't flexible enough to deal with them. Um, maybe Jiva and Paul, can you perhaps give us some concrete insight into the types of cases that the ICC was seeing uh, that, that led the court to decide, yes, we, it, now is a time where we really need to revise the rules further to take these matters into account. Thank you, Jennifer, and good morning, everybody. Um, well, Claudia already put some historical context to the provision of gender and consolidation. As you know, Article 7 of the rule uh, on joinder contain uh, a limitation, and it is that once an arbitrator, any arbitrator is appointed or confirmed by, by the ICC, the court or, or the Secretary General, joinder is not possible without the consent of, of all parties, including the, the additional party. And this is not just, uh, this limitation is just not random. It, it is actually a, a safeguard. It was introduced to, to ensure that all additional parties are afforded uh, an opportunity to, to participate in the constitution of the arbitral tribunal. Uh, I think we all agree that it is a, an essential right to, to any party to, to an arbitration to, to participate in, in the constitution of the arbitral tribunal, either by nominating uh, an arbitrator or in the case of additional parties, to join in the nomination of, of either side. However, in practice, this has posed um, two, again, practical issues. First, uh, undue delays in the constitution of the arbitral tribunal caused by tardy submit requests for joinder uh, submissions. 
or also by requests for joinders that were uh, advanced or, or, or promised and that were ultimately never uh, filed. Uh, you may wish to know that we, we always warn the parties before proceeding with the confirmation or, or appointment of an arbitrator or before the court takes any step towards the constitution of the arbitral tribunal, we inform the parties that we are in a position to do that and, and highlight the fact that if they want to join or, or they are thinking of joining an additional party to the case, they should do so before a time limit that the secretariat normally sets. And if we receive, receive a reply from any party uh, indicating that they, they are at least considering or still assessing whether they should uh, or is warranted to join uh, an additional party to the proceedings, the secretariat would not in principle uh, move forward with the constitution of the arbitral tribunal. So, so this uh, uh, some sort of limitation of article seven sometimes causes delay to, to the proceedings, which uh, at the secretariat we always try to, to mitigate and to minimize. And the other consequence, practical consequence is that uh, as article uh, seven once indicates, in the absence of agreement of all parties, a post confirmation or, or appointment joinder uh, is just not uh, possible. The court, uh, however, has encountered situation as, as you uh, as you ask Jennifer, where uh, a so-called post confirmation or appointment joinder seem reasonable or, or appropriate for the efficient resolution of, of the case in, in general. So we can um, quickly go through a few examples of, of these situations. Uh, if, if we can share the, with, the, with the audience the, the underlying facts of, of the case. Okay, so uh, a first example, it's a manufacturer that engage respondent as its distributor and respondent in turn engage claimant as its marketing agent. Claimant file an arbitration against respondent for, for breach of, of the underlying uh, marketing agreement uh, they had concluded. And throughout the proceedings, the manufacturer, which is was not a party to, to the arbitration, terminated uh, its distribution contract with a respondent granted exclusive distribution rights to one of its subsidiaries and also in parallel file an action in, in national courts against claimant to prevent it from marketing uh, its products worldwide. Claimant then sought to join the manufacturer in, in the arbitration. Uh, but as the arbitral tribunal had already been constituted, uh, respondent and the manufacturer, uh, the manufacturer being the additional party, they had to consent to, to the joinder pursuant to the rules. And unsurprisingly, they did not consent. Uh, so that led claimant to, to, to then file uh, a motion in, in, in the ongoing national court proceedings uh, precisely to compel the manufacturer to, to arbitrate and this motion was at some point granted and because of that then the manufacturer was joined as an additional party in the arbitration by agreement of all parties. So the, the, the takeaway from, from this uh, case or from this situation is that of course, if the arbitral tribunal uh, had had the authority under the rules to decide on the joinder of, of the manufacturer, as it will now under Article 7.5 of the 2021 rules, then the parties to the case could have been determined earlier and, and more efficiently. Um, Paul, if I can just uh, interrupt you there for a moment, because I see that we have a question from Ishan Madan, um, if it's possible to bring Ishan in so, uh, so that we can have that, that question, that would be wonderful. It apparently relates to the matters that, that we're speaking about now in terms of the different, um, the different case scenarios. 
This is TJ from FTI. Uh, Sean has been brought in as a temporary panelist um, and is available via microphone and camera if he, if they would like to turn their camera on. Yeah, Welcome hi. Uh, hi. I'm sorry if I could actually, uh, it would have been better if I were able to turn my camera on. I'm not in the position. <laughs> yet. That's okay. No <laughs> worries. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. So yeah, this question was because uh, Claudia was introducing the rules and the new amendments. And you know, there is a transition phase right now, which some parties might consider as a good opportunity to take benefit if there is any over the 2021 rules to uh, enter into an uh, arbitration and uh, to actually move for the constitution of the tribunal. What happens if the tribunal is constituted before 2021? And then after uh, 2021, the parties move for a joinder. Is that possible uh, in the transition phase between the 20, 2017 and 2021 rules? Paul, maybe if you would like to answer that. I thought the, the question was directed to Claudia, no? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm glad it? to answer. Sure. Uh, it's fine. Uh, so in essence, the rules apply based on the date when the case is filed. So if the case is filed now, the 2020, 2017 rules will apply uh, and uh, the 2021 rules will apply after uh, January 1st. To, so for any cases filed after Gen January 1st, 2021, the rules apply to those cases. Yeah, so the, the, the rules or, or, or this new Article 7.5 would not uh, apply retroactively, unfortunately. No, it's it's based on the filing date of the case when the case is actually filed. And 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 and, and I think that it's based on on, on considerations of, of predictability that uh, the parties need to to know beforehand which uh, version of the rules would apply to to their on underlying uh, arbitration. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, Sean, this is a TJ from a family. I'm going to move you back to an uh, attendee. Thanks. Paul, would you like to to uh, sort of pick up where you left off? Yeah, let, we can now go to to another example. Um, claimant granted respondent a claimant which was the owner of of a liquefied natural gas terminal granted uh, a respondent fifty percent of the storage capacity at the terminal. A claimant had also an identical agreement with another company, Company X, with respect of the remaining 50% of, of the storage capacity at, at the terminal. Um, claimant first brought an arbitration against respondent only, seeking the, the payment of, 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 of outstanding storage fees. And respondent's uh, main defense was mm -hmm. that uh, it, it was prevented from, from paying uh, based on, on force major events. Uh, that's a very summarized uh, case. So then Clayman sought to join company X as an additional party in the, in the arbitration because basically uh, the, this company X uh, also failed to, to, to pay the storage fees and was in breach of, of, the, of the underlying contract. And company X relied on the same, more or less same force major events and defense as respondent. Uh, claimant also uh, argued that the three entities, claimant, respondent, and company X, basically had a, a single commercial and, and legal relationship. But because the core arbitrators in, in the arbitration had been already confirmed and respondent objected to, to the joinder of company X into the proceedings, company X was, uh, of course, not joined. So then what, claimant, what the claimant party did is that, of course, it filed a, a new request for arbitration uh, against company X. And, and what happened was that in, in practice, uh, in, it, it, these two arbitrations were, were run in, in, in parallel and with the same arbitral tribunal. And even the first arbitration kind of paused and, 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 and at some point the two cases were at the same pace. So, 
uh, at the end, uh, the second arbitration was uh, consolidated into the first one uh, by agreement of, of all uh, the, the participating parties under Article 10A of the rules, therefore bringing all claims and all parties together in a single uh, proceeding. A result that, of course, could have been achieved earlier and, and, and more efficiently if the tribunal had had the power to join uh, Company X. So that, that, that's the, the takeaway from, from this case. And, and as this, and these are only two so, some sort of simple examples out of dozens or, or perhaps hundreds of, of cases in which uh, that the court confronted and, and which somehow led the, the court to, to consider that uh, a revision of, of joinder provisions was, was warranted. The new um, Article 7.5 uh, dispenses with uh, the need of an agreement from all the parties and, 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 and in the case of joinder and give the decision-making power, give the authority to the arbitral tribunal to join a, a consenting uh, additional party. Paul? Yes, sure. Yeah, I just wanted to add very, very briefly here that this case, this second example, I think is a really good example of why there may be a need later on in the case to join a party because, you know, the case lives on and uh, the positions, first of all, the positions of the parties will probably develop or crystallize when the tribunal, for example, is preparing the terms of reference. And the dispute itself, uh, also the dispute outside of the arbitration, goes on in, and develops. And, and it's also a very good example for a, for a second reason, which is the typical, um, ob, uh, the typical obstacle, oftentimes, to a joinder after the constitution or confirmation of arbitrators is the existing party, the one who doesn't request the joinder of an additional party to object. Uh, for different reasons, sometimes simply because it's easier to argue a case which is more contained and uh, many, many uh, oftentimes parties have, uh, are reluctant to let in an additional party and make the case uh, bigger or, or, less, uh, or, or less simple for them or more difficult for them. Um, and it is precisely this kind of situation that the new, the new rule now, uh, the new rule now um, addresses, whereby if the additional party who missed out on a certain part of the procedural history uh, is fine with joining the case as is, uh, then as Paul was uh, saying before I interrupted him, uh, then the, the decision is up to the tribunal to decide whether it makes sense or not to allow that. But Jiva, can I just take advantage of your uh, intervention here to interrupt Paul even further and, and just ask, you know, one, one of the things that, again, back in prehistoric times when I was at the Secretariat, one of the good things about having a very limited sort of joinder practice was that it helped to keep the administration of cases simple from the Secretariat standpoint. I mean, now with these yet, you know, even more expanded provisions on joinder that will be coming into effect in 2021, what are the implications for the secretariat in terms of its day-to-day -day work administering cases? Well, Jennifer, you're absolutely right. The, the arbitration evolved uh, quite a bit, I think exponentially during the last at least 10 years. It's a completely different field than it was 10 years or even 20 years ago. Um, and, uh, and this, I think it has implications. I think that it is fair to say that the cases that we see now, I've been there for almost nine years now, and I already see a very big difference. The cases are becoming more complex uh, because I think that the, <laughs> simply the disputes are becoming more complex and ICC arbitration especially is really now getting into each crevice of the planet um, and that, that brings up uh, procedural complexity oftentimes where, where especially where parties are, um, are not, uh, you know, um, mega machines, uh, dispute resolution machine firms, um, the procedure can get quite complicated. But I think the important thing here is that, of course, there is a lot to be said about keeping the proceedings short and sweet. 
Uh, but that's a bit of a limited view because, I mean, it's all well and fine to have a nice, short, quick arbitration, but if that doesn't really dispose of the dispute and half of this dispute remains left out, then you're not really doing arbitration, uh, efficiency and arbitration any service. In fact, you're doing it quite a big disservice, I think. So I, um, I think that this is the, the reason, and, and this is where I think the, this is where the beauty of Article 7.5 comes in, where it strikes a balance. It is for the tribunal to consider all relevant circumstances, as the article say, to, con to actually to actually decide whether or not in a particular case, it uh, a joinder after the constitution of the tribunal may contribute to the efficiency or may actually mean that the whole thing becomes less efficient. And I think this is where Paul, uh, Paul is going next. And if I could just jump in Jennifer uh, briefly, because it seems like we've gotten quite a number of questions in our Q and A and in the chat about uh, whether a third party can be joined under 7.5 if the third party doesn't consent. Uh, so just to clarify for everyone, uh, the third party must consent if the tribunal has already been constituted. So the change under 7.5 is that only one of the parties, um, the existing parties in the arbitration must consent to the arbitration in addition to the third party consenting. Previously, all parties to the arbitration had to consent after the tribunal was constituted. So yeah, I just wanted to clarify that specific point regarding the change. When yeah. we're talking about one party consenting, it's one party uh, ex in the existing arbitration, in addition to the new third party consenting to joinder under 7.5 after the tribunal is constituted. And, and I would also uh, add uh, to what uh, Claudia was saying that not only the additional party has to consent to be joined into arbitration, the additional party has also to consent to the tribunal, to the to the tribunal as it has been constituted. So th that is also important because uh, we need to make sure that, that we need to avoid any potential risk that the award may be set aside uh, afterwards on grounds of on proper constitution of, of, the, of the arbitral tribunal. Um, I just see that we have a question uh, from Dr. Tramasamy if if we could if we could uh, have that question now, TJ, that would be great. He's been promoted to a temporary panelist. Okay, great. Dr. Tramasami, are you with us? Oh, he's dropped off of the uh, meeting in general. It seems. Oh, I guess we. Oh no, actually no, he's there. I, I take that back. Oh. He is there. Okay. Uh, Dr. Tramasami? Uh, Dr. Ramasami, can you hear me? You're muted right now. If you could unmute yourself, we could take your question. Well, if well, how about we uh, let him re-raise his hand? I'll put him back in the attendees okay. and we can move on. All right, that sounds good. Paul, um, do you... Uh... I wanted Jennifer, to we also some... have a question from uh. Phil Lacavara. Uh, oh. I don't know if you want okay. uh, um, to ask his Can we have Phil question? Lacavara on to ask a question? Sure can. Uh, Phil uh, has been uh, promoted to a temporary panelist. He's coming in now, Hi, there he is. Hello there. Hi. Yes, uh, my question concerns um, the uh, similarity or substantial, I, substantially identical nature of the arbitration clauses. I understood Claudia and Paul to say that uh, for a joinder or a consolidation, the arbitration clauses must be the same or substantially uh, identical. And I wonder what the standard is for determining uh, what elements are necessarily the same or substantially identical in order to have the predicate for joinder or consolidation? 
I think we both use uh, the terminology. It really should be compatible, but Shiva, if you want, Shiva or Paula, if you want to ex uh, expand on that, would be useful. I just want to mention that re regarding Joinder, that is not so much of an issue as in, in the context of, of consolidation, but very briefly, in the context of the new provision, Article 7.5, it may be uh, something to be considered by the arbitral tribunal when assessing, at least on a prima facie level, whether to accept the, the request for joinder of this additional party. And yeah, and I think, uh, Philip, thank you very much for your question because it raises a very, a very, a very nice, a nice point, which is in terms, if, in common sense terms, we often. Uh, speak about joinder consolidation um, and you know just multi-party arbitration from the beginning uh, interchangeably and I think that the where whereas in the rules as, as Claudia mentioned at the beginning consolidation is really a technical term that means that there are already two different arbitrations existing and that one party applies for to have them merged and, uh, and, uh, and oftentimes parties actually in their pleadings, we see often use consolidation. Um, they object to consolidation where they object to basically certain claims being included in the tribunal, in the, in the case or to parties be continuing to be part of the case. Uh, and that, in that, uh, that will be treated under, um, under article six of the rules. Um, if it's an objection before the tribunal is constituted, which is the court will have to be satisfied of a prima facie existence of an arbitration agreement binding everybody. Um, and that's a completely different test, if you will, from the consolidation. So um, I'm really grateful that you raised that point because it's a very, con very important conceptual, conceptual difference that we have to bear in mind while we're going through this, because it's true that otherwise in conversational um, English, we would say John, the consolidation or, you know, um, um, quite interchangeably. Hmm. Uh, Paul, maybe just Thank kind you. of building on what, what uh, Phil raised, you know, it would be helpful maybe to have some kind of practical guidance as to exactly how Article 7.5 is supposed to work in practice. I mean, there's kind of a laundry list of things that arbitrators can consider, but exactly how is an arbitrator who has to um, make a decision under Article 7.5 supposed to go about that? What, what do these criteria actually mean or imply or require? Well, that, that, that's a very good question. And, and, and I think there's no uh, right or wrong or straightforward answer because, I mean, this, this is a new provision that will enter into force uh, next year. Uh, of course, there is no set uh, criteria or, or test, uh, so that's part of, of, of the challenge or uh, of this uh, provision. But uh, I would say that arbitral tribunals, when 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 making uh, a finding at le on a prima facie level, because you you can notice from the wording of of, of Article Seven Five that it says. Uh, the arbitral tribunal may uh, make a finding prima facie on, on, on jurisdiction, but there has to be a, a final uh, decision of the arbitral tribunal's jurisdiction over uh, the uh, additional party. Because we, we need to, to start from the starting point is that at least one party to the arbitration objected to, to, to the joinder of, of this uh, additional party. Or even if they all agree that, they, that, should, that party should be joined, the tribunal, the arbitral tribunal, has nevertheless to to have a say on on jurisdiction. So, at, at least on on the, on the prima facie uh, decision, and and this is to be seen. It can take the form of of a procedural order, for for example. Uh, they can take inspiration on on the test under Article six four of the rules that that Jiva was just referring to. Um, so, for example, uh, they should con the arbitrator should consider that the arbitration uh, can proceed as to those claims with respect to which they are prima facie, again prima facie, satisfied that uh, first uh, there an arbitration agreement under their, the rules uh, may exist and that is binding to to all uh, parties. So that's Article Six Four One, and and in this regard, they can they can 
check uh, elements such as the, the, a reference to, to ICC arbitration. In the case of, of non-signatory, let's say the additional party is not a signatory to, to the underlying arbitration agreement, uh, the matter can be allowed to, to proceed with regard to, to this uh, additional party if there is some sort of evidence that this party, which is again a non-signatory, was involved in, in the negotiation, in the performance or, or overall conclusion of, of, of the contract or containing the arbitration agreement. Uh, another uh, factor, let's say, uh, if the, the party, this additional party seems to be under the total control of, of, of either claimant or or respondent, or there is some sort of, of, of ownership, but a mere link of ownership in principle wouldn't be enough to, to ascertain uh, jurisdiction over, over a non-signatory. Uh, and here, again, in the context of, of, of non-signatory, if that was the case, there can be a different treatment or a different standard if the if the addition, non signatory additional party is for example an individual or 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 a corporate party of course in the case of, of an individual the the threshold the standard should be should be higher uh, basically the individual would have to 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 have obligations toward the other parties on on its uh, personal uh, capacity and then if, if you wish, if, if we are on a multi-contract uh, situations uh, where the claims are, are brought under different arbitration agreements, uh, that the arbitral tribunal should in, in, in principle analyze uh, um, whether the arbitration agreements uh, may be compatible as, as, as was raised um, a few minutes ago. And if all the parties may have agreed to, to have those claims being determined together in a single uh, arbitration. And of course, while, just while we're on the subject of practical guidance, of course, the, the arbitral tribunal here is going to be reacting to an application. And what's kind of new now is, you know, you have the tribunal in place but I guess you also have a role for the secretariat here if, if an application for joinder under Article 7.5 is, is made. I mean, do I understand that correctly? What's the interplay between the secretariat and the tribunal under Article 7.5, if any? I mean, tell me if I'm wrong. Maybe, maybe I'm misunderstanding the provision. No, you're, 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 you're totally correct. Uh, we agree that there, there is indeed a, an interplay, and, and, and it, it will be an, an interesting situation because so far, up to date, requests for joinders are, are normally dealt and processed by the secretariat, so we have control over that. It's true that now we are going to have an arbitral tribunal in place, which will be in charge of conducting and deciding the case. But in principle, the, the, the other provisions of, Servi, uh, of Article 7 and, and, and provisions on, on request for arbitration, Article 4, or, or on the answer will uh, apply mutandis mutandis. So in principle, the party wishing to join a, an additional party, even post constitution of the arbitral tribunal, they should uh, submit the request to the secretariat. I would suggest that they do it in the proceedings with copy to, to the other party and the arbitral tribunal so that everyone is, is aware and should contain the same requirements as, uh, as would a, a, a regular request for, for arbitration. And then we would proceed if we have all the information we need, probably we would be uh, in, in, in contact with, with the arbitral tribunal and would take into consideration the already potential ongoing uh, procedural time timetable. And we would proceed with the notification to this uh, additional party to, to precisely check if it is uh, willing to, to be joined in order to take it already to, to the arbitral tribunal. In parallel, we would invite comments from the other party to check again whether uh, that party would object to, to the joinder or would agree or basically make 
uh, no no comments and they would have to file an answer and then it would be for for the arbitral tribunal to to agree from a procedural perspective with the parties as to how to treat this request for joinder and i guess in a way try to minimize any any delays or or, or perturbation to to the already ongoing um proceedings yeah. and so oh, it's oh, sorry, Go no, ahead. It's fine no jennifer it's it's it, the secretariat retains the, the exactly the same function as it did until now. It's just that until now, we did all of this. It's for the secretariat always, always to notify the request, to notify the, uh, the answer to the other side, the same for the request for joinder. Uh, the only thing that now happens is that once we everything would basically stop and fall through if uh, one, one of the parties objected, now we 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 get uh, an answer from the from the additional party. They they agree, and then from then on, it goes to the decision goes to the tribunal. And what the tribunal will also probably have to do, of course, if all this uh, if the additional party is on board, they will also have to probably invite the comments uh, on. And and again, and this is the tip. It's the tribunal, as you said, that if the tribunal is already constituted, the tribunal will retain its it's case management functions. So it's the tribunal needs to invite the party's comments on the points that will influence its decision whether or not to allow this joinder or not. Those are enumerated in Article 7.5 uh, and are apart from the points on, on, on uh, prima facie jurisdiction that uh, uh, Paul, uh, Paul elaborated on are also the, the purely procedural points. How does this affect the, the delay? Um, what's the stage of the proceedings? How do different parties view how far we've come and, and what the, the consequences of this joinder will be on the procedure? I, Paul, I'm sorry if I like derail you still further because I know there are other cases that, that, we, that we should address, but I just want to bring Laura in here on this issue of joinder because this is really, I mean, to my mind, this is really one of the absolute core changes to the rules, perhaps the most dramatic change uh, that, that, that's in the 2021 rules is this change with respect to joinder, the addition of Article 7.5. And I'd just like to hear from you know somebody who can speak from the user's perspective, how valuable, Laura, is this change in your view? I think you are exactly right, Jennifer, that from a user's perspective, and in particular, you know, my corporate clients um, for the past 25 years have really been operating in the energy and construction engineering fields where multi-party, multi-contract projects are really common. Um, and, and from that perspective of the users, I think this addition of Rule 7.5 is probably the most important change in this rule revision and really provides the, the hope of of a real step towards even greater efficiency and flexibility. Um, and it is a very, very welcome change from the user's perspective. You know, unfortunately, and this example in, in this case scenario, I think exactly lays it right. And as Jiva mentioned, you know, um, once a dispute is live, it's sometimes very hard to get the parties to agree um, on anything. And, you know, whether it's because relationships have become strained or one, one party is inherently suspicious if somebody else wants it, they don't want it, um, or they perceive a tactical advantage to having to force multiple arbitrations um, which, and, and have less efficiency because it gives them an advantage over the other side. Um, so by removing a, the veto power of one of the parties in joinder, which is really in essence what we see this rule seven five change doing is if the if the party to be joined whether it's you know a sub who was in a back to back contract or a joint venture partner who was somehow left out of the original filing, <clears throat> but if the party to be joined agrees and is willing to accept the tribunal as constituted is willing to. Um, except the terms of reference, <clears throat> and you remove the veto party, veto power of one of the other parties, that's really significant and really, I think, will help improve efficiency and flexibility. So I, I, I think this example really shows well how important this change could be for corporate users. 
But in your view, Laura, does this change go far enough? Or would you have preferred to see perhaps even a greater change? I mean, you're the person here who really has the experience, the practical experience as a, as, as a, as a corporate representative with, with what goes on. So in your view, is this far enough? Or would you perhaps envision that down the road there could even be further revision, further expansion of Joinder? Well, for, I think the, the joinder point, I think, does really um, uh, cover what, from a user's perspective, um, the is is what is what is useful and helpful, and and what parties need. I think this example raises a consolidation issue, Jennifer, and I think from a user's perspective, that the change to um, Article Ten B of making it clear it can be multiple agreements is very helpful. Um, but where I think from a user's perspective, this, um, this example maybe shows uh, a place where, from, where the rules perhaps could go farther. And I'm sure Claudia has, has, will tell us the great reasons why they didn't go that far already. But um, you know, 10, if, 10, if the revision to 10C had been an or rather than an and, so you could have you didn't require the same parties, for example, where it's that you have the same legal relationships. So we have many, many um, in in my in my former practice in house, um, both in energy and construction. We had numerous situations where you'd have, either have multiple JV partners or you had back to back contracts with subsidiaries and contractors, and so you might not have the same parties, um, but you had the same legal relationship. So you, for example, in a case where we had pretender contracts with one corporate entity and, 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 and corporations frequently have different subsidiaries that operate in different jurisdictions. So you can have a contract entered into by one subsidiary um, for the pretender work, for example, and another subsidiary for the post award work. And you could even have multiple contracts for that post award work. Um, and they're all in the same relationship one example in a major transportation project, um, they're all serving the design function, the designer um, to a prime contractor. And we ended up in, in multiple arbitrations because um, it was not the same parties, it was not um, the same agreements. Um, and um, I think if 10C had an or rather than an and, so you didn't require the same parties, um, but you had the same legal relationships and the same contract, the same project, and the clauses were compatible. Otherwise, um, you know, that might promote even more efficiency from the corporate perspective. Claudia, was there discussion during the rule revision process about going further? Um, you know, I understand that, that uh, I don't know the specifics, but I do understand that some of the issues at stake were sort of hotly discussed. Maybe you can give us a kind of behind the scenes look of on, on, on what the rule revision process involved, the types of positions uh, people took and, and why sort of the rules came down the way, the way they did, what the balance that was struck. Uh, Jennifer, I think you encapsulated uh, the the moment exactly right, which is it's a balance, uh, striking a balance. Uh, so uh, in the ICC rules revision process, uh, the ICC um, commission uh, considered the draft and got uh, extensive comments, hundreds of comments from uh, different uh, council uh, participants, users, uh, national committees. And there's a lot of different views, particularly on this issue. Ultimately, the question is, you know, is, um, is consolidation going to be such a situation in which parties who are not to the same agreement find themselves in the same arbitration that, and the, the, where they haven't signed the same arbitration agreement. So there really is that balancing uh, to assure that there is the maximum amount of efficiency, but also the maximum amount of procedural flexibility. Paul, maybe, maybe 
if, if you agree, now might be a good time to talk about the case examples related to consolidation that sort of prompted the change. Because as, as Laura points out, in some sense, the change appears very modest um, to Article 10. So um, maybe you could just sort of give us a very concrete idea of why this change uh, was necessary. Sure. Um, well, it, in, in general, the court confronted um, the issue of, of, of the, the same arbitration agreement in singular or, or in plural. And it constantly decided, for example, that two cases based on two identical arbitration agreements uh, containing two different contracts would not could not be consolidated under 10B because it wouldn't meet the requirement of the same arbitration agreement. Uh, an example, and TJ, if we can uh, again share the, the, the facts of the case, um, a claimant filed an arbitration against a respondent based on two EPC contracts. One, uh, well, basically none of the contract was signed by claimant, both were signed by claimant subsidiary and one by respondent and the other one by respondent subsidiary. Uh, an important element in, in this particular case was that respondent filed jurisdictional objections on the ground that uh, precisely this, that, that claimant was not a party to either um, of, of the arbitration agreements contained in the, in the EPC contracts. And, and, and respondent requested that those jurisdictional objections were decided directly by the retail tribunal, which was already uh, in place. So uh, claimant moved to file a, a second um, ar arbitration against respondent, but also against respondent subsidiary, which as I said, was a, a signatory of one of the EPC contracts. Uh, this second request was, was also based on the two EPC contracts, but claimant included an additional claim. It indicated that in addition and or in the alternative on a guarantee provided by respondents. So at the end, they, there were three um, uh, arbitration agreements which were overall compatible. Clayman, uh, of course, tried to, to have these two cases consolidated, but as I mentioned, there was already a, an arbitral tribunal constitute in the first place and, and respondent, uh, again, uh, objected. You, you will see that the respondent will always object to, to consolidation. And, and so then and, and at the end, as Clayman's claims in the second case uh, were made also in addition and or in the alternative on, on the basis of, of another arbitration agreement that one contained in the, in the guarantee, the court considered that uh, the claims in the two cases were not uh, based on the same arbitration um, agreement. So the court ultimately decided not to consolidate this uh, two cases. But, but another important um, issue or consideration in, in, in this particular case was the fact that uh, the court considered that consolidation, again, in this particular case, uh, as a practical matter, uh, would have resulted in allowing, allowing the joinder of, of respondent subsidiary as an additional party to the first uh, arbitration after the arbitral tribunal had been constituted, which the court considered that would be uh, against the provisions of, of, of Article 7 on, on joinder. So there you have a, a, a kind of a link between uh, the, the, the provision of, of joinder and, and consolidation, because it's true that, that, that in practice, if the, if the consolidation was allowed, what Clayman wanted from the beginning, which was to have a, a respondent subsidiary uh, in the proceedings would have as a practical matter uh, have a core. Whether it was efficient for, for the case or not, that's, that's another, another issue. Yeah, and that's, that's often, not often because we don't see these cases every day, but that has been a few times already the case that um, the, 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 the conditions of either 10, Article 10B or 10C may be complied with or not, but you also always have to keep in mind that there is also a, a final part of Article uh, 10, which uh, says that the court may consolidate. And 
if, when these conditions, those are preconditions, but even after they're satisfied, the court still retains the discretion whether to consolidate or not. And, the, uh, and the, some of the circumstances are precisely linked to the um, constitution of the tribunal. And this has been the case already a few times that um, the, uh, the party for one reason or another did not request a joinder of an additional party and then filed an, um, a new arbitration either only uh, against the additional party or just against everybody that was in the previous case and the additional party as well. Um, and this is where we need to be careful and the court has been very careful to consider what this implies for the new party, if you will. Uh, because the new party, of course, if you decide to consolidate the new party, the party from the second case, had no way to influence the constitution of the tribunal because the cases will be, the last case will be considered in the earlier case. And this has been a very, very important consideration of the, of the, of the and I see that there is a uh, question that is basically related to that point again, and uh, uh, by an anonymous attendee, so we can't call him in, uh, but, um, but the, the, that is, the, the question is whether the, if the uh, additional party does not consent, whether the tribunal should still decide to allow the joinder. Um, no, I think that is precisely what Article 7.5 is trying to protect the additional party against, because the additional party has to be okay with joining the arbitration with the three arbitrators or one arbitrator that are already there. And, and yet, if, if I may add, I, I think, and I'm, I'm pretty sure that's what's uh, going to happen, it's going to be, although the rules require this consent from an additional party, by experience, trust us that it's never as simple as an additional party filing a submission saying, yes, I agree. Normally, I mean, they would file, I don't know, like 100 pages submission, and at least from the secretariat's point, you are not sure whether they are objecting or agreeing or both or condition. So it's true that we will see that even the term in consent will be uh, challenging so to say also we at the ICC we cover I mean all regions of, of the world so depending on the region some you know some some jurisdictions are so to say more sophisticated than others and 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 it's true that you may end up with with an additional party filing submissions but not it won't be clear I'm, I'm sure from the beginning whether are you agreeing or or not? And then again, it would require require a lot of interaction between the secretariat and the arbitral tribunal because at some point, I guess the the issue would be would have to be dealt by by the the arbitrators. Paul, well, maybe you can share with us the second case that was uh, in part an inspiration for the rule change because I think it it really goes specifically to some of the issues that, that Laura was, was raising for us in the construction context. Yes, so um, there was um, a, a contractor, a claimant contractor that filed a, a, an arbitration against the owner of, of the project and also against the owner's agent. And, and it, it was based on, again, on a EPC contract, uh, which, wa which had been signed only by claimant and the owner's agent, but on behalf of, of the owner. So the owner's agent uh, filed um, a request for arbitration against claimant, a second request based on the PC contract, and this in, but also on a second contract, which incorporated by reference the arbitration agreement in the uh, EPC contract. Claimant requested the consolidation of, of these two cases uh, to which, again, not surprisingly, the, the other party objected. And, and, and the, the main grounds for, for, for responding to, to object to consolidation refer to party autonomy. Basically that if they had two different contracts, they would expect, expect as a, again, as a matter of party autonomy that they be decided by different arbitral tribunals. And, and, and another ground for objecting to, to consolidation was that uh, in respondent's view, having the second file case decided by the arbitral, the same arbitral tribunal as in the first case would uh, delay uh, the proceedings in the first case, which uh, were um, 
advancing as it always happens in consolidation there's always a, a time like a first or, or subsequent uh, proceedings one of which of course is normally more advanced than than the other uh, so in, in in this case uh, the court was invited to to examine whether the claims in the two cases object of, of the consolidation request had been made under the same arbitration agreement and 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 here the court considered actually that the arbitration agreement in in the second contract not on the on the epc did not appear to to contain its own complete and comprehensive uh, arbitration agreement rather the court considered that it only incorporated by reference the terms of, of the arbitration agreement set out in, in, the, in the EPC contract between claimant and, 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 respond, and the owner's agent. Also, uh, the court was of the opinion that as both contracts were signed by the same parties, the incorporation of the arbitration agreement from the EPC contract into the second contract by, by reference, was an indication that perhaps the parties intended that the dispute under the two contracts could be heard and determined together in, in a single arbitration. So at the end, the court decided to consolidate these, these two cases under 10B. You know, as, as I see these cases that, that prompted these changes, you know, of course there, both the changes with respect to joinder and consolidation are designed to, you know, allow parties and claims to be brought together in a single proceeding when there's reason to believe that all of the parties contemplated that that would be possible. Um, but, you know, it also seems to me that maybe as a practical matter, one of the ways to increase the likelihood of that happening would be for the claimant to name everybody uh, that they want in an arbitration and bring all of the claims they have in a single request for arbitration. I mean, is that is that sort of a practical solution to, to get around a lot of these problems that end up arising down the road if you try to start multiple proceedings and split things up? It is, I th if you don't mind, I, I can start with replying to that. Um, it is precisely um, the, the way to go in an ICC arbitration. And that is because of the very conceptual difference between um, an arbitration uh, starting against multiple parties under multiple arbitration agreements, where it's not entirely clear that um, the parties, all these parties agreed to have all these claims under all these contracts decided together. But if that is the case um, and you have a, a, a doubt, it's much better, it's much smarter, if you will, to file an arbitration against all these people together, knowing that then uh, you have two salvation, two options for, uh, two opportunities for salvation. First is that those parties actually don't object, in which case everything continues, it goes to the tribunal and the tribunal will, um, will decide all these claims together. Uh, if the parties object, what the rules provide is for a two-tier mechanism, is first the court will have this, this preliminary review to really weed out um, any parties or any agreements that have nothing to do here. And uh, this is where I come back to uh, to uh, Paul's, uh, uh, Paul took us through, through the kind of analysis that the court will make. And, if you want me to put it in very, very simple terms, the court will really look at whether uh, a tribunal, after being fully briefed, having the full position, uh, having full briefings on the facts and on the law, could decide, could potentially, conceivably, decide that this party can be, uh, is bound by this arbitration agreement or agreements, right? Or that these claims, or that the parties actually decided uh, to, to there is intent, uh, there was intent to have all this determined together. If the question is, well, we don't know, <laughs> that, will, that will usually mean that the case will proceed as to everything because the court makes only an administrative decision and cannot and is not fully briefed simply, right? 
So you have that salvation already. Um, it's not like a, 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 a non-existent analysis. We will require documentary evidence, but it will be very, very prima facie, very superficial, right? Um, and, and then the tribunal ultimately will decide. Um, whereas if you have a consolidation, the consolidation is a one-stop shop solution. You have, uh, you have already, you're faced with uh, two different arbitrations, let's say it's two, and then the, the court's decision, it's the court's decision. The court's decision is not subject to a further review by the tribunal. Of course, the tribunal will then have to decide uh, whether or not um, it has jurisdiction over all of this uh, to decide them together. But in a way, the consolidation is a case management tool for efficiency, right? So it will, it, it really doesn't make much sense to in doubt consolidate because you're doing a very bad service to the, to the, to the whole efficiency. Then everything will be joined, everything will be joined together and the tribunal will potentially decide that it shouldn't be, right? So I think that there is a certain deference to how the parties initially filed the case. Um, and um, parties also oftentimes, oftentimes know better. I don't know if, um, if Laura has, uh, um, has uh, um, an, an opinion on, the, of, of, on that. I, I, you know, I think, Jiva, I agree with you. Um, it's obviously better for the parties and, and, and more efficient if, if off the bat uh, they include all the relevant parties and, and claims and, and, and contracts in the initial filing. I think unfortunately what happens, which is why the, the rule change to 7.5 is so welcome is you don't realize until after a dispute has started, you may have filed and had a, an, a, an, and nominated and had your party appointed arbitrator um, actually appointed by the court um, that you need an additional party. But I think also to your point, Jennifer, um, I think that one of the other practical um, steps that um, companies can and should consider and, and lawyers should consider discussing with their clients when you have a multi-party, um, you know, multi-contract project, uh, including express provisions about consolidation and joinder in the arbitration clauses. I mean, I think one of the interesting things for me about the last case we just discussed is I think the rule changes will make it even clearer that consolidation would be appropriate in that fact pattern um, where you know you incorporate by reference that the terms of the arbitration agreement from the the main EPC contract um, uh, but um, you know unfortunately I think what happens from the corporate users perspective is they're negotiating their deals and the uh, dispute resolution clause is often one of the very last things to be uh, Put in the contract after they they've spent a lot of time negotiating the other deal points and you know at the time they're entering into contracts everyone's very optimistic and they're not really um, anticipating how these dispute resolution mechanisms will work or or not attaching the significance to it one of the things that 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 um as a head of global litigation in-house um, at acom we did is we we had our our versions for different types of contracts ready to go for our lawyers to pick up and, and provide it to outside counsel and maybe at least get the first version of what we'd like in the draft early on. Um, uh, but I but I think that the, it's true that both, you know, drafting to contemplate consolidation, if, if that's what you're going to want, or to be able to bring multiple parties and multiple contracts into a single arbitration and, and drafting for that sort of joinder um, uh, would be helpful, as would obviously filing the claims together from the first instance. I'll just echo uh, Laura's comments. I mean, wearing my hat uh, as counsel and really uh, a near daily basis of advising uh, transactional lawyers and clients about drafting dispute resolution clauses when uh, we get asked to assist, as Laura said, it's often in the 11th hour um, and someone says, oh, can you just review the dispute resolution clause? And my first question is always, are there other agreements in this transaction, because if so, uh, we want to be make conscious decisions about whether 
uh, disputes under this particular agreement should be heard alone, or whether uh, we want the possibility or potential or the de definitive uh, outcome that disputes arising under all of the different trans uh, agreements in the same transaction will be heard in the same arbitration. You know, what's and interesting to Jiva about what you're saying is that, you know, when the when the rules were revised in 2012, you know, the idea was to get beyond what had been sort of the historic view at the ICC, which was the claimant gets to determine the parties to the arbitration. That was the touchstone principle for, for many, many years. And then, you know, the court started developing these practices under the 1998 rules that were eroding that, that principle. And then, of course, the 2012 revision blew that principle out of the water intentionally. You know, the idea was to try to put the parties on a more equal footing in terms of determining who the parties to the proceedings were. But what's interesting and in what you're pointing out, Shiva, is that still, claimant has a kind of built-in advantage at the get-go in terms of naming into a single proceeding everybody and every claim they might want uh, that, of course, you know, the respondent being the respondent doesn't have because it's not the first mover. So it, it's sort of mm -hmm. interesting that although that, that principle has been uh, eroded, there's still a kind of tactical advantage to being a claimant if you want to use it. And, and Jennifer, um, and all in the context of, 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 of consolidation, uh, again, claimant of, of course still has a, an advantage and, and, and in the context of, of consolidation I'm referring to bringing the claims and I remember a case at, at the core it, it was a, a huge uh, construction case the claimant filed and so it was an ongoing arbitration and the claimant filed a new request for arbitration for breaches that arose throughout uh, the the construction projects and and during the the first the uh, the first arbitration that was ongoing or or claims that were ripped for for adjudication on on, on arbitration and then these claimant parties sought to have consolidated this later case with the huge ongoing construction case and 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 i don't remember if i think it was under 10c and Basically, or in principle, the requirements were somehow or arguably met. However, the court uh, used its discretion on, on the catch-up uh, phrase in, in, in Article 10 that it can't consider uh, all other circumstances uh, to decide on consolidation. And, and they actually decided not to consolidate these two cases, but there was a particular element. It was the fact that Clayman had already tried to bring this set of claims into the arbitration, which was denied by the arbitral tribunal. Uh, of course, the new requests were not exactly the same claims. There were many more claims. And, and it was considered that having these two cases consolidated would actually cause more harm than, than, than good or efficiency to the arbitrator because the, second, the, the, the first case was already ongoing and at a well advanced stage and bringing all these numerous claims, although they were uh, they involved the same parties, the same project, probably the same contracts, would not be would be somehow prejudicial to to the ongoing case. And Jennifer, I think that um, you're right. The claimant still has an advantage, but one of the things that, from a corporate perspective, I really like about the change to Rule Seven Five is it you know, militates against that a bit. You know, for example, if you've got an owner bringing a claim against a contractor in a big project, which we've had certainly in the past for my corporate clients, and there is a key subsidiary who they deliberately didn't name, who's got flow through claims, um, it gives the respondent the ability to join, assuming that sub agrees, um, to the arbitration, even if the, the, the owner in that situation deliberately chose not to bring them in. So sometimes the claimant's making tactical decisions um, where in the interest of efficiency, you'd want to bring another party in a multi-party project in. And, and this allows, that this sort of gives the respondent the ability to get around both the, that claimant's initial tactical decision and a veto by the claimant. So, I mean, again, I, I, I think that Rule 7 to 5 change from a user's perspective is very, very welcome. It's going to be very helpful in the future in improving efficiency. 
Um, I see that Alex Fessis has has sent us a, a question here. I'd like to read it so that so that we can get uh, the panel's reaction. Would it also not uh, not be often the case that this front loading in a single arbitration may not be possible? either because one, the potential involvement of third parties in the dispute may not be clear, or because two, the joinder or the parallel case will have been requested initiated by a different party. Maybe Jiva, would you like to, to respond? Yeah, I mean, I, I already wanted to add that of course that uh, just file against anybody that comes to your mind is <laughs> is a bit of a no simplification, especially in in, uh, in very complicated uh, disputes, and it also can backfire because I mean you can really <laughs> you can really get into a lot of into a very very long proceedings before even you get to the constitution of the tribunal where it really it really wasn't you really didn't stand a chance, right? Um, so and and of course it's it's not you can't always. Uh, you can't always predict um, what the other side will do, but that's the thing with with the with the joinder provisions, and that's where it's important that the rules actually put both sides on an equal footing. So maybe we should add to if you well in advance, you need to look at the rules because the rules differ. So you need to really look at you know. Uh, if you have a, a complex transaction, what are the rules for, for multi-party arbitrations already? Article 6, uh, 8, 9 in, uh, in ICC, 7, which gets you to multiple multi-party arbitration, right? By joining an additional party, and 10, and, uh, and see how, how they play out. And the other thing is that um, then if the additional party joins, uh, if the if the respondent, for example, joins an additional party, we are still under the first the first system, if you will. There will still be a first. It's exactly the same mechanism. There will still be a first um, uh, screening by the court, subject to the jurisdictional decision of the court. This is what the parties have to keep in mind. Um, so you can play smart. You can say, oh yes, I mean the claimant first of all has. Uh, a lot of liberty, but also a lot of, uh, you know, responsibility. It's a two-sided coin, right? And you, exactly, you don't know. You can try to file an arbitration, which is really discreet and simple. But then, if it's so obvious, you're, it's very, very likely that the, the respondent will just join additional parties and additional contracts into the case, if they are necessary contracts. Um, coming back to Laura's... Uh, to Laura's uh, wishes uh, before that she wishes that 10, uh, Article 10C was broader. I think this is what the parties have to keep in mind that maybe the, the, the proper, the, the easier way to address this kind of situation is not through Article 10. It's probably through uh, the other provisions that we mentioned. Um, and, and maybe a simple reason, if I may offer it for, for that is that if you, if we followed Laura, which has a lot of has a lot of compelling force her argument right that the uh, the tenancy should simply say same parties or same legal relationship the difficulty we encounter is the lack of predictability and the clarity which is what claudia which claudia uh, actually said we have been uh, having these discussions now for a year and you'd be surprised how diff how different the parties the different people's perception about what the same legal relationship actually means are it's astounding how different people people think about this. In and I think you know, a, a point on that, that that you made when we were talking about this in preparation for this is you know from the user's perspective, I tend to have the the energy construction user's viewpoint, but the user's viewpoint as a lender or a financial institution might be quite different, where the same legal relationship. Um, would exist, but you would not ever expect to have um, dif disputes with different borrowers consolidated together necessarily. So I and think- yet, And yet it was only in passing, but it was considered in a case. And of course it was not the determinative factor because the, the requirement of the same parties was not met. And yet uh, there were a, a, a few views 
that in a situation where you know there was a borrower lending to to different customers, it was actually consumer loans because the uh, transactions were basically identical and they were concluded more or less around the same day. Um, and the provisions are, are the same. Um, the provisions of the loan agreements are the same and the issues raised in all the cases are the same. That could be considered as the same legal relationship. That was one party's position who argued, argued quite strongly. And I think it's that, that fear um, that you know you just don't know how this is going to be interpreted and argued that ultimately um, flip the scale and 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 uh, into saying let's uh, let's uh, favor predictability of result. Uh, it's the same Laura in uh, construction cases, right? Um, how many people think that? Uh, that um, main contractor and subcontractor uh, disputes under the main contract and the subcontract should be decided together. It's the same legal relationship. I mean, it's the same project, right? It's a chain of contracts. But if you are under a, a jurisdiction analysis, you under a, a consent analysis, you will have to see whether or not the employer actually consented to argue things together with the subcontractor that it didn't wasn't even aware of when the main uh, main contract was concluded right you will have this uh, this decision on on um, on on consent you will have this analysis on consent how do you fit that under the same legal relationship it becomes very 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 complicated to explain what kind of legal link between the two contracts must you have to have the same legal relationship or guarantor, um, make the con uh, uh, principal contract and, uh, and guarantee disputes? Is that the same legal relationship? It's just guaranteeing the same obligation. But I'm not sure that all the guarantors will actually would actually like to be, or all the or all the um, or the lenders would actually like to have the guarantors also in the in the in the dispute. Well, and this in some sense ties back to what Claudia was saying. I mean, these rules are applying to a wide, wide, wide variety of disputes. I mean, the the ICC's caseload is incredibly diverse, so there is this need to sort of strike a balance. I do, though, just want to, if I can, I'd kind of like to come back to something Claudia mentioned that's going to take us in a slightly different direction, which is Article 12.9, uh, which, which is a, a, a new provision related to the constitution of the arbitral tribunal, which we haven't yet gotten to. And I, I really think it's, it's important to talk about because this is really quite a dramatic provision. I mean, it, it allows the court in certain circumstances to override the agreement of the parties with respect to how the tribunal is going to be constituted. And I, I would be interested to know, I mean, I, I assume there's a good story behind this as to why, what, what case was it uh, or cases that, that prompted the need for this kind of change? I don't know if Paul or Jiva, you'd like to fill us mm -hmm. in on that. Magically, the, the reason why will appear on the screen um, in a few seconds. I think we are in the last scenario. Okay. So this is quite a well-known case because it was, has been subject to setting aside proceedings in, um, in Paris and it's been subject to already two uh, judgments in the BVI. So it's in the public domain, but very, very briefly to underline the, um, the facts of the case um, is basically the, a case is between claimant and three respondents uh, for breach of the alleged breach of the respondents um, uh, um, obligations under the shareholders agreement. Um, the, the, all the, the claimant and the respondents are uh, the shareholders of this um, of this mobile operator. Claimant alleged that respondents had denied claimant access to information, withheld dividends and suspended its shareholders rights, which included the right to nominate two directors and also that they were conspiring against it and seeking to terminate its participation in the shareholders agreement as a shareholder and co take complete control of the mobile operator, right? Now, the, the beautiful part of this is the shareholders agreements arbitration clause, 
which um, which says that all disputes shall be decided by a panel of five arbitrators, one to be designated by each party and the fifth one to be designated by the other four arbitrators. Each party is a defined term and it means party to the shareholders agreement. Um, claimant, respondent one, respondent two and respondent three are all party parties to the shareholders agreement. And the claimant's problem with this clause was that uh, if the shareholder, if the arbitration clause was to be applied literally, it would nominate one arbitrator, whereas the respondent side would have three arbitrators. And not only that, also the, the president being nominated by the uh, by the party nominated arbitrators, the uh, respondents would also have a much bigger influence on the president. So place of arbitration is Paris. And, um, and in Paris, we have the DATCO decision, which puts the equality of uh, the equal participation of the parties in the constitution of the tribunal um, above the contract and, and makes it a question of public policy, a principle of public policy, which is what Claimant was arguing. Claimant was saying that um, that, uh, that would make the eventual award unenforceable. And so that the court should actually appoint three arbitrators <laughs> that, um, according to the rules, uh, because it's simply inoperable. The clause is simply inoperable. Respondent on the other hand, respondents uh, were saying that uh, the court should apply the arbitration agreement because failure to apply arbit the arbitration agreement is also a reason to set aside and endanger the award. So the, 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 the question before the court was which evil is the lesser one, right? Um, whether or not, and even the claimant, the claimant even produced uh, a e um, legal expert opinion uh, by Professor Rarosson, uh, who, uh, who explained how he thinks that the, um, how he thinks that the, um, um, this kind of uh, arbitration agreement would be viewed by the Paris courts. What we had to do, in, well, the analysis that the court was making is whether, um, the parties having agreed that the the arbitration that there is a certain provision there was no there was no uncertainty on what the the procedure under the arbitration clause was the question was whether or not it should be applied or not and the court ultimately uh, concluded that it's more risky to apply the arbitration clause. It's more, uh, it's more uh, prejudice, prejudicial to the arbitration to apply the arbitration clause uh, because of the fact that it would give a preponderance of influence to uh, the respondents on the whole tribunal. And also because of the fact that um, it looked like although respondents were arguing the opposite, respondents' interests in the case were actually aligned. Claimant filed, well, you heard about what the, what the complaints about claimant were, that the respondents conspired and that the respondents um, were, were breaching its right. Respondents, all, to, all of them together, um, all the claims were filed against respondents jointly and uh, severally. And there was also uh, some letters on file uh, that claimant was able to produce that confirmed uh, that respondents two and three um, support respondents one posi position under the uh, on the bridge uh, under the contract and one of the main comments one of the main arguments of respondents were that um, we are not aligned and it's clear because the claimant only sued, there was parallel proceedings and claimant only sued respondent one. And in any event, claimant is saying that respondent one is the mastermind and is the most important in this scheme. Uh, but then with that letter, you saw that basically that may be the case, but that still doesn't mean that they are against each other. 
So with a very heavy heart, and we're, <laughs> we have been holding our breath for, for, a, for a long time now on what the final verdict of the courts would be, um, we, we decided to then ap uh, appoint all five members of the tribunal. But then you ask yourself, under which provision did the court did that? Because it, it simply doesn't fall under Article 12.8. Article 12.8 is for a three-member tribunal where respondents cannot uh, nominate jointly a co-arbitrator. Simply not the case here, right? Um, and, and, the, and the rules are quite clear in saying that you know, the party's agreement on the, on the constitution should be followed. So this is the kind of exceptional circumstance that uh, it does not fall under any of the, of the, of the rules that we have. And that um, in order to protect the, the proceedings and the eventual award, uh, the court has to retain its power to, um, to appoint all five members of the tribunal to give uh, equality to the parties. There was another case in which also um, uh, under the arbitration clause, so the, under the arbitration clause, claimant and respondent two uh, should nominate one co-arbitrator and respondent one another one. And then a claimant objected. Uh, it didn't want to nominate together with a respondent because obviously they were not aligned in the case. And the respondents also said that they couldn't also not nominate together. And the reasons are quite uh, simple because I mean, respondent four was the joint venture that owned respondents eight and nine, and it's in turn owned by claimant and respondents one and three. You see, it's very messy. But anyway, you cannot say that the respondents are together. Uh, and even though that was a three member uh, tribunal and it could potentially fall under the Dutko, um, the Dutko uh, situation, it, it didn't really. Other um, examples are, for example, where you have a sole arbitrator and only one party can, um, only one party is um, allowed to, uh, to nominate the sole arbitrator. But just so before everybody thinks now the court will just go ahead and appoint all members of the arbitral tribunal uh, every time it sees fit, it is really in exceptional circumstances. And I have ways to prove that. Um, and, and, th th and that's the following. Um, the, the court already in very many cases uh, did not go ahead and appoint all three members of the tribunal in a three, three, tr uh, three member tribunal situation, even before even under 12.8. Um, and and I, can, I can give you two examples. One is uh, where respondent had to nominate one arbitrator and a joint venture of claimant and respondent had to nominate the second co-arbitrator. So claimant, in theory, it could, and it was argued that claimant actually in its arbitration, in the arbitration clause waived its right to nominate. Um, because the, the, the parties to the contract were claimant and respondent, whereas the joint venture was the, uh, not party to the contract, was, but was given the right to nominate. And uh, claimant said that that's simply not possible and nominated a co-arbitrator. And the court actually um, confirmed that co-arbitrator in, two, in another similar case as well, where it was a joint venture of, uh, of a respondent and another a third party even, the claimants uh, nominated an arbitrator and argued that the court should confirm that arbitrator and the court did that uh, on the basis that it would be, it, it would be um, not appropriate to follow the arbitration clause because it would give pre the preponderance of the uh, the preponderance of influ influence on the tribunal to one side. So when there is a way to still ensure equality of uh, of the parties in the constitution of the tribunal, the court will take that. The court would not simply go for uh, for appointing all three members. Um, now. Sometimes that's not possible. Uh, for example, in in, in um, and and sometimes also sorry, and sometimes also the court 
um, the court will sometimes simply ignore the procedure in the arbitration agreement and appoint on behalf, uh, appoint the, the nominees of the parties. And in other circumstances, the court has also just followed the arbitration agreement as, as, as written instead of applying, uh, appointing all three members of the tribunal. Um, and that was a case where a respondent was to nominate one co-arbitrator and claimant an additional party, another one. And the president again was jointly to be nominated by the co-arbitrators. The difference between that case and the cases that I just mentioned is that here, all parties to the arbitration were also parties to the contract or the other way around. All parties to the contract were the parties to the arbitration. So claimant and additional party also had aligned interests because they were both contractors. And in fact, respondent, respondent actually joined the additional party claiming that it was jointly uh, liable with claimant for the breaches under the contract. And in that case, there was simply no harm to follow the arbitration agreement as, uh, as written. And in many other cases with the sole arbitrator as well, uh, uh, we also, the court also followed the, the arbitration clause. So it's really, it's really the exceptional circumstances when you cannot get to a fair result, always keeping in mind the risk to the award at the place of arbitration and any possible, to the extent we can, we can predict them, places of enforcement. Sorry, that was a bit long. <laughs> Jiva, it's really an uh, excellent explanation from my perspective. And just to add briefly, again, striking this balance between assuring that the parties have control over the process, but also uh, assuring that there is an enforceable award. And that's really what the ICC brings to the process. And so it, uh, this uh, amendment uh, to the rules essentially assures that the ICC court has the tool under the rules. It, it needs to assure that the um, it has the power to uh, have to to do what it is uh, charged to do. That there is an enforceable award. Otherwise, uh, we really are in that uh, between a rock and a hard place. If we were to say, well, uh, we couldn't uh, actually constitute the tribunal in the way that the clause has expressly provided, then there is that question of, well, then if we don't have the case go forward, then, uh, uh, then one party is actually left without a remedy. Uh, so it's essentially looking at those very, that very, very rare circumstance where we, there is the equivalent of a pathological clause, a clause that can't actually operate. And so it's uh, by having the institution, the ICC rules behind the process, there is that assurance that the uh, process can go forward. In just Laura, do you, oh, I'm sorry, Paul, go no, ahead. I just have a minor common and in is that you have no idea how creative parties can be when drafting uh, arbitration agreement. So, so the, the, the rules do need to be flexible enough to kind of remedy this uh, pathological or, or, or unbalanced uh, arbitration clauses. And Jennifer, I was going to say, I think from a user's perspective, um, this change is also a good change. I think as, as we've heard and as as I read it, I would expect it would be used really in the rare exceptional circumstance. But you know, when parties are drafting, and each party nominates one arbitrator, sounds like it should be inherently fair. And as this case example showed, it, 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 it might not be, and it might really create a problem. I mean, if we have a, a few minutes, Jennifer, there's a couple of other provisions, I think, from a user's perspective, were <clears throat> very helpful and in, in, in really the, as the goal of efficiency, flexibility, transparency, and fairness, which are really the things that corporate users care about the most. You know, the, the addition in Article 11.7 of the disclosure requirements for third party funding, I think goes to a fundamental issue of transparency and fairness from a user's perspective. Um, if the arbitrators don't know about third party funding, which has really taken off in the last decade, um, then, you know, corp my corporate clients are worrying about whether the arbitrators have some undisclosed relationship, which from the arbitrator's perspective, they couldn't have disclosed because they didn't know about the existence of the funding arrangement. 
And so I think that really will promote greater transparency and, and assure corporate users. Um, the change in Article 22.2, again, may seem like a very minor change from the may to shall, but the, the direction that the arbitrator shall adopt case management procedures to ensure efficiency and, and turning to Appendix 4 is, I think, a very, very welcome and critical change from a user's perspective where, you know, the costs of things like document disclosures um, and requests have grown exponentially from corporate clients' perspectives, and this gives the arbitrators more of an ability to curb that and, and to streamline things. The um, raising the threshold for expedited procedures to 3 million is a very welcome and, and huge change from a corporate perspective because the cost of arbitration and the time of arbitration um, really are things that corporate clients care about and, and making them go faster and with less cost for the disputes under 3 million, I think is, is a huge change to, to make that. And then last but not least, electronic filings. <laughs> the, the express provision for electronic filings is an incredibly welcome um, provision from a corporate user's perspective because again, it goes to cost and efficiency. Well, and of course, the we we haven't it hasn't been the focus of our panel today, but there there are a number of changes for 2021 that really go to, in some sense, this pandemic situation that that we've been living through, and that and that it allows for a lot of things to happen virtually uh, that perhaps in the past normally didn't. I mean, I think that there was a sort of inherent flexibility under the rules to allow for some of these things, but now the 2021 rules are really going to make that express and, and um, encourage parties and arbitrators where appropriate to handle things in, in, a, virtual, in a virtual manner. Um, and, and particularly, I mean, one, one question that has come up, which of course the note Claudia, which you were so involved in, in drafting the note with respect to COVID-19, addresses this question about, well, you know, given the in-person language with respect to hearings under the ICC rules, does that really mean that we have to be in person, in the same room, looking at each other? Obviously, this is, uh, you know, something that has, has proven to be either difficult or impossible these days with the pandemic. Um, that is, of course, a note a noteworthy change, but it is something that's already addressed by by the note on COVID nineteen, and and which I think aptly points out that there is flexibility in this respect. But Claudia, you can speak to this far better than I can. Just briefly, uh, there was the question, or is there there is the question under the existing rules about whether specifically the tribunal can determine to hold the hearing virtually, uh, that is uh, by remote means of communication if one of the parties objects in light of the language in English that there would be the hearing quote in person. So the change in article 26 just confirms that tribunals may after proper consul consultation with the parties decide to hold the hearing by remote means of communication. And it sets out the way in which the tribunal should make that determination. Um, we've discussed in prior uh, panels that uh, there have been ICC tribunals that have decided to go forward with uh, remote hearings, uh, even over the objection of one of the parties making a determination in light of the circumstances and considering uh, the language in English um, in relation to uh, the language in uh, um, the, the text in other versions of the ICC rules. But uh, I consider this amendment under Article 26.1 to be uh, important in clarifying that there's no question that if there is an objection by one party, the tribunal has that power, but it has to make that uh, determination considering all the facts and circumstances. Jiva, just quickly, because I know we're we're running out of time now, but um, to what extent has uh, have you at the Secretariat seen parties taking advantage of this language in the note and, and holding virtual hearings in, in complex cases so far? Oh, you need to unmute yourself. Definitely do. Um, actually more than expected. I think at the beginning of when we started talking about virtual hearings, kind of the general perception I had the feeling 
was that, okay, it's fine when it's a really simple case with, uh, with a few participants and a, and a very contained hearing. And when it's a big complicated hearing, it's not going to work. Well, this has not been an, our experience. We have had quite a few hearings now in big important cases with many participants I don't know, a hundred participants in a hearing um, with, um, with uh, you know, um, uh, with presentations, with the direct, with cross-examination, with even uh, witness and expert conferencing, conferencing quite a few times. Um, and um, and what, is, what is interesting to see is that oftentimes uh, parties have actually made use of the checklist for the protocol. Um, parties and tribunals have made use for the, of the checklist in the protocol in, in from, the, from the guidance note on mitigating the COVID. And this was precisely our hope that, you know, this is not going to be uh, useful only for the, uh, for, for the period when we are uh, under the, 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 the confinement measures in the pandemic, but also for, for the future. And, um, and um, I think that, uh, one, maybe a few takeaways, uh, maybe first is that, yes, it is possible to do uh, hot tubbing and apparently it works really well, uh, if, as well as in, as in person, um, that yes, it is possible to have um, witnesses examined in their own languages and, and, and subsequent um, and, and sub uh, sequential uh, translations, and that has actually it, it needed to be discussed, but the, uh, ultimately there was not really a big issue uh, with uh, making sure that the parties actually have enough time to present their case. Um, one also um, interesting issue that has come up is how to uh, fix hearings uh, when you have people in three different time zones. And even this has been done. I saw a hearing where uh, the uh, the, the hearing started at 3 a.m. for somebody in Brazil and or another one where it ended at 2 uh, a.m. for people in, uh, in Korea and yet it went and, uh, and we had good feedback about that, uh, that hearing. I think that we have also seen a few uh, cases where the tribunal simply decided to you know, um, hold the hearing for half day in the middle of the day in Europe. Usually Europe is in the middle, uh, it happens to be. And so that people have human, human hours uh, at, both, at both factors. Um, the, there, there has been a lot of uh, concern about um, you know, uh, will witnesses really be alone in the room? Will somebody be able to pass them um, notes while they're, uh, they're, they're testifying? I think a very elegant solution I've seen is that the witnesses cannot have any documents, that there is either a, a camera in the corner of the room that shows the whole room or a 360 camera um, that shows that there is nothing there and that the witnesses can only use the documents that are on a share, uh, file sharing platform. And that has also worked quite well. Um, there has been a few disputes where the, where the tribunal, tribunal had to decide, uh, one party wanted a professional um, uh, IT services uh, operator and one party, uh, one party uh, didn't. And um, oftentimes it was decided to use this kind of uh, service provider and that the cost will be then distributed in the final award and so on it goes and on it goes. Yes, yeah. I would go here. I, I know and I would love for us to be able to continue talking but I am getting signals from, from TJ and Merrick that, that we are unfortunately out of time. So uh, it, really I just wanna thank all of you for this very, very interesting discussion and very educational discussion about these uh, very important changes to the rules and how they'll work in practice, what users will may well think of them. Um, this has just been a, a, a tremendous discussion and very, very happy to have been a part of it. So thank you all very, very much. Thank you. Thank you to all the audience. Thank you. Thank you.